All right. Thanks, Natalie, for the uh, introduction. And I appreciate everyone taking the time to uh, join me this evening. Uh, Natalie, give me a thumbs up if you can see the slides. Perfect. All right. So tonight I'm going to be talking about uh, robotics and minimally invasive uh, hip and knee replacement surgery. Um, I'm, I, as Natalie mentioned, I'm one of the adult reconstruction surgeons here at Rothman. Uh, and I do specialize in hip and knee replacements. As a disclosure, I don't have any financial disclosures related to this topic. Um, I do selectively use robotics on some of my arthroplasty cases. And my goal tonight is not really to influence uh, anyone, but to educate you and help everyone kind of understand what these uh, hot topics are uh, so that they, they can better determine what surgery is uh, best for them. This is a general disclaimer uh, that we have for these uh, community lectures, especially given that they are in person. I'll give everyone a few seconds to read it. Uh, you don't want to hear me read it out loud. All right. <clears throat> so again, the goals of the talk are really to understand what robotics means in terms of hip and knee replacements. I do want to address some of the frequently asked questions, not only that came in uh, before the lecture this evening, but also some patients of mine have uh, while we're in the office discussing this. Uh, I want to provide a little bit of perspective on some of the more commonly dis discussed uh, aspects of robotics and minimally invasive surgery, and then at the end, answer any questions you have. My goal is to leave about 20 minutes or so at the end of the talk to answer any questions. So like I said, please feel free, type them uh, into the uh, chat box. We'll keep a running tally uh, and we can go through them at the end of the talk. So a bit about me. Uh, Natalie were mentioned uh, everything, so I was in practice before uh, joining Rothman last year. Um, you know, my clinics are at Willow Grove, Abington, and Shelfont. Um, but more importantly, a little bit about the Rothman Institute. So when it comes to hip and knee replacements, we're not only national experts on this topic, but we're global experts. You know, we, we do over 17,000 hip and knee replacements a year as an institution. It's something that we care a lot about and a lot of what our foundation was based on. So we certainly have expertise in both robotics and non-robotic uh, treatment for hip and knee arthritis. Um, that's something that we hope to share with you. And we were, that's one of the reasons we do these lectures is so that we can better connect to the community. In terms of what hip and knee replacement comes down to, it really is uh, pretty simply a uh, discussion in terms of arthritis um, of either the hip or the knee joint that has not responded to non-operative treatment. Uh, and there's no other permanent treatment for that outside of either replacing the hip or the knee. And that's what a hip and knee replacement is. Just like the goals of any surgery, uh, we hope to improve the patient. That's why we do the hip and knee reconstructive surgery. And if you look at the bottom right at the uh, figure there, you can see that when it comes to an impact on quality life years of patients, there is not one single intervention in medicine of any specialty that helps improve that more than reconstructive orthopedic surgery, which includes hip and knee replacements. Uh, hip, hip replacements themselves have been done by the medical community as a operation of the century. So in general, they're very, very uh, successful operations. And that's one of the reasons we enjoy our jobs as much as we do. But the challenge always becomes, how do we make them better? And when you have something that is already very successful, you start getting into finer and finer details in terms of how to optimize that even more. The things that have been studied so far in terms of improving the outcomes of these procedures and continuing to improve them, it really comes down to surgeon expertise and skills. Obviously you have to have a surgeon who knows what they're doing in the operating room and also having the right team so that every team member can work cohesively together and keep everyone on the right path towards getting a good outcome. And when we talk about robotics, I hope every, everyone on this call can understand that robotics are, are a tool, okay? They don't replace the surgeon, they don't replace the team, they don't replace any of the expertise that those members have, but they are a tool that can be used to try to optimize a patient's outcome. Uh, and the tool, unfortunately though, is only as good as the person uses it because if, if you don't have someone who's using a tool correctly, and certainly bad things can happen. And a robot is no different than, than any other tool in that regard. Robotics and surgery themselves is certainly not a new idea. Uh, it's been available for about the past 20 years since the Da Vinci was uh, first approved by the FDA, at least in the United States. Um, and minimally invasive surgery was around even before that. So the question is, well, why are we just talking about this more and more now? And it's largely because these types of procedures and these types of words, such as minimally invasive uh, surgery or robotic hip and knee replacement, they get a lot of press. If you just do a Google search, you, know, you can see mine from a couple hours ago, you get over 5 million hits. Um, and you, there's been recent New York Times articles on this. And then a lot of uh, practices and or companies have done a great job of marketing these as well to try to exemplify ways in which they may be able to improve patient care. 
So they seem omnipresent and, and all over the place. And, and that's one of the reasons we want to have this conversation this evening. The other aspect that I found most interesting was an article that, that just came out. And don't worry, I'm not going to get into too many articles in this talk. Uh, but they sent a survey to 600 patients uh, at random. And well over half the patients thought that robotics led to less complications, better outcomes, a faster recovery, and less pain when it came to uh, hip and knee replacement surgery. And then what I found even more striking was about half the patients uh, of that survey thought that a low volume surgeon, so someone who doesn't do hip and knee replacements often, but they would prefer going to that person if they're using a robot compared to someone who only does hip and knee replacements over and over and over again. Uh, and the reason I found that most interesting is because almost all the data we have so far shows that experience and specialty matters, uh, meaning that you're doing the same thing with the same team uh, over and over again leads to better outcomes than opposes uh, someone who only does things uh, occasionally. That's why we subspecialize as much as we do in medicine. Uh, so clearly the patients have a different perception in terms of what robotics may be able to add to the team to make up for that ground. So again, to back up a little bit in terms of what a traditional knee replacement looks like, I'll be honest, I wish when they uh, used or created this term, you know, a few decades ago that they had said knee resurfacing instead of knee replacement. I think it would A, be more accurate and B, also give patients a little bit more comfort that we aren't just cutting out knees and wide sections and putting things in because that's not what we're doing at all. In a traditional uh, measurement, what we do is we use these guides and we put them on and they help us decide intraoperatively how much bone to resurface or, or to take or cut and where to do that. And the goal is to provide these resurfacing cuts so that we can give the patient basically a new cap on their femur and a new surface on their tibia that has replaced your arthritis and allows them to uh, carry on with their daily activities and not have any difficulties. So obviously during those procedures, there's a lot of things that need to go right. You need to have the, the guides placed properly. The cuts have to be in the proper position on the bone. You have to remove the right amount of bone and you have to have the ligaments and the tendons around the knee balanced properly. So during a knee replacement itself, there's probably about 200 steps, give or take, um, that need to happen. And any one of those steps, if they're not done properly or correctly, can lead to a bad outcome. The goal of a knee replacement in particular is to have a well-aligned, properly balanced, and stable knee. And that's what we want to do. And that I, I equate this to kind of climbing a mountain. There may be many different routes to get there, and every surgeon may be a little bit different in terms of what steps they use, but the goal is to get to the top of the mountain. And it doesn't necessarily matter what path you take. Once you get to the top, you will be happy. And it's the same thing with knee replacements. If as long as you do those three things, get a well-aligned joint that's properly balanced and stable, the patient will likely have a good outcome, or to put it differently, will have a much better chance of having a good outcome as opposed to having something, uh, having a, a joint replacement done where those three goals weren't accomplished. And certainly within knee replacements, there is room for improvement because if you look at the studies, somewhere between 10 and 40% of patients, and it's typically closer to 10, but regardless, a large percentage of patients uh, aren't satisfied after their knee replacements. And we don't really know why that's the case. And that has been one of the large reasons that we've started to look into robotics a little bit more because there's certainly things that maybe we could do to improve patient outcomes, one of which could be patient selection, making sure patients re would really benefit from their procedure, or two, you know, having proper communication or expectation discussions with the patients. I, I try to tell all my patients, I can't guarantee them a pain-free need that's gonna feel like it did when they were 18. Um, so certainly if the patients don't have the right expectations before the surgery, then they're not gonna be satisfied with the operation. But more importantly, it comes down to, are, is there a way that we can put components in better, whatever that means, or to, in order to give patients a better chance of having that outcome where they're satisfied with the operation. And that's where robotics come into place because they do allow um, patients or, or surgeons, I should say, to have a better idea of where to make those cuts before even going into the surgery. And then if you're using a computer guided system that has images of the patient's knee beforehand, they can also help make sure that those cuts don't deviate from whatever that plan was. So that's really the goal of, of robotics is to allow for surgeons to be more precise in terms of the cuts that they're making to resurface the knee. And how they do that is by getting imaging either during surgery or before surgery. And that al allows the computer to generate a model so that you know exactly where you can put your components. And you can change the positioning based on certain patient uh, desires or what you think would be best for the knee. And also uh, by doing this computer modeling, determine kind of what the balance is in the knee itself. So it gives the surgeons a lot more information um, before the surgery even happens or during the, and certainly during the surgery itself 
to try to optimize what that knee should feel like for the patient to have a good outcome. And do the robotics deliver on that promise in terms of allowing for more precise component positioning? Absolutely. So they typically allow for more precise uh, placement of components. Uh, somewhere between one and four degrees. Um, it decreases the number of components that are put in outside of what we consider uh, a norm, which is about three degrees of deviation from the plan. Uh, and they also allow the surgeons to plan things beforehand. And you can't, you certainly can have an idea before you go into the operating room when you're doing things in a traditional manner. And, that, and again, that's where experience comes into play. You can have an idea of what an x-ray looks like and what their physical exam looks like, and then you know, make your operative plan curtail to that. But the robotics, it's certainly if you have preoperative imaging, you can actually kind of see what the knee would look like after the implants are in and then change your plan before you even get in the OR. The issue though with robotics is that even, even if you put everything in exactly where you want it to, we don't have any data to suggest that patients actually do better with that. So we, you know, this is a, the, one of the largest studies here uh, outlined uh, in the literature is that you know, up to three degrees of deviation from whatever the plan was, patients did just as well as at 20 years after surgery than patients who had everything exactly where they were. So it turns out, you know, knees certainly do tend to tolerate a little bit of play in terms of where the components are positioned. So even if we put them in perfectly, it doesn't actually mean that patients will do any better. And on top of that, the data actually suggests that we don't have any patient reported outcomes that, that say that doing any type of robotic assisted knee replacement leads to patients to have better outcomes long-term than, than surgeons who use traditional means. Um, so that's kind of the conundrum that we're in the robotics. We know that we can hit our goal more precisely with a robotic assisted surgery, but we don't know if that's actually making patients better. I will say it certainly doesn't seem to make patients worse. Okay. So I, I think that's certainly uh, an important note to make, um, but we're still trying to figure out how to best use robots as a tool to help us improve our outcomes, which I said, like at the beginning of the talk, is the ultimate goal. And I wanted to touch on unicompartmentals or so partial knee replacements as well. Again, this is another avenue where uh, robotics gets discussed a lot. Um, this is where you replace part of the knee. So you can see that the x-ray there on the right side of the screen, uh, only part of the knee had severe arthritis. So the plan was to replace part of that knee. Uh, and robotics are certainly used for this. Uh, these cases are probably even more technically demanding than a uh, total knee replacement. Um, and the data we have definitely shows that experience matters even more for these procedures than a full knee replacement, meaning that if you go to someone who doesn't do a lot of these or isn't well trained in these, um, the outcomes are going to be even worse uh, than if you go to someone who does these often and is well trained in these procedures. So I, again, it's where robotics come into play because the goal is that you can use a robot to kind of plan some of these uh, intricacies that you would pick up over experience uh, using the computer. And, that's, and robotics do help with that. They do help with the alignment. Um, they get things more precise. You can put the implants in a better position. But again, the surgeon has to know where that position should be. And, and that's something that's really hard to read. A lot of it does come with experience and, and, and training. So you can have a good feel for what the component should feel like. And I wanted to show one diagram of kind of how robotics works. And I'm going to get into things a little bit more um, during the, the second part of my talk here. Um, but how robotics works in terms of the knee replacement, you know, this demonstrates a, a partial knee replacement, but basically once you have a computer model, uh, the green section is the part of the bone that you, the, the computer and you have determined, all right, this is the part of the bone I'd like to remove uh, to put my implant in where I want it to. And then you just start, you know, using your, your saw or burr uh, to remove that bone. Um, and then once it's all gone and the white's there, then you know you've made the proper cut. Um, so. It is a very exact science in terms of how that cut can be made. And again, it does give the surgeon a lot, a lot of power in terms of really dialing where they think that component should be. The same is true for total hip arthroplasty. And I, I'm not going to spend too much time on hip replacement with this um, as much as knees because it's a little bit less discussed. Uh, there, are, there are so, aren't so many types of robotic uh, platforms for hip, hip replacement at this point. Uh, but they certainly can be used for it. It's the same principle. Again, you're basically planning the surgery before you do the surgery. Um, and you can get things quite precise in terms of where you want the, the acetabular component position and where you want the femoral component position to make sure that you have components in a position that you like. Some of the newer software is allowing us to actually do models in terms of range of motion for the hips. Um, again, this is before the surgery even takes place. 
So if you have someone that you're concerned about their anatomy for some reason and want to see, you know, what positions would make that leg most likely to dislocate, uh, you could use a software to try to help guide your surgical plan. Um, again, I, I think uh, approach matters a, a little bit for when we talk about hip replacement and robotics as well. So I don't want to dive into this too much, um, but certainly, again, the same idea is, is present with hip replacement as it is for knee. And the same principles are going to be hit. You can exactly plan how you want uh, the procedure to be done with a robot before you do it. But it's the same issue that you have with the knees in terms of we don't actually have any long-term uh, patient reported outcomes that show that patients who ha have a robotic hip replacement done compared to a traditional robotic uh, compared to a traditional hip replacement actually have better outcomes long term. I do want to touch on the safety of the robots. This is a, a very commonly asked question as well. Uh, the robot is not just doing the procedure. The, the surgeon is in control, and I have a better picture for that later in the talk. Um, but the system does have hard stops. At least these are built into the system. Uh, and the surgeon can choose kind of what to do with them. But uh, as you can see on this picture here, and I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but where the green is, you know, that's the saw actually that's cutting the bone. If that saw was to go outside of this green area, the, the saw would actually shut off. Um, and it's the same thing with the burr on the right side. If it gets outside the green area by too much deviation, and typically this is on the order of a half millimeter or a millimeter, um, the saw will actually shut off. And so the, it's a little bit safer to the soft tissues in that regard, as long as you have them pulled out of the way, of course. Um, but you can't, really can't deviate from the plan very much. So there, there certainly is a safety element to robotics as well. What are some of the potential downsides? Uh, certainly some, of the, some of the robotic systems do require patients to obtain a low-dose CT scan beforehand so that they can model the bone before the surgery. That's what allows these models to take place. Um, there is a longer operative time. It's somewhere between five and 25 minutes, typically. Um, again, as the team and the surgeon gets more used to using the robot, that, that, that cuts down, but there are some more steps. And we do know that the longer a surgery is, the greater the risk of infection to a degree. Um, but again, I, I can't say definitively that robotics increase the risk of infection necessarily. So uh, there's a learning curve for using robots compared to uh, not using robots. If you haven't been trained with them and you're just trying to learn these uh, later on in your career, it takes a little bit of time to get used to things. Um, and then pin, pin sites. So you actually have to put pins into the patient uh, on both the femur and the tibia in order for uh, the computer to be able to track where the leg is during the surgeries. And there have been some case reports of those fracturing. Now, that is not common. It is an exceedingly rare complication. Um, but again, it, that's something that's, that's unique to uh, robotic surgery. So some of the common questions that I get that I wanted to touch on tonight as well is what is robotic surgery? Because I do think there's a lot of patients who think this is kind of what, what it looks like. There's just some robot that's, that's in, the, uh, in the operating room and the surgeon's just having coffee um, somewhere in the hallway. That is not the case at all. So we definitely uh, are present and the surgeon is looking at the plan and then using uh, either a tool like this or a freehand tool um, and then going after the bone that is green or purple depending on what you're using uh, to operate uh, or to execute the operative plan. So it's still the surgeon using the tools. It's not the tools doing anything by themselves. Uh, the surgeon is absolutely in control. And if during the case, the surgeon wants to you know, stop using the robot or doesn't, doesn't like how the plan is being executed, they can do that. They can turn off the robot, go back to conventional instruments. Um, so like I said, the, the surgeon is ultimately in control of the, of the surgery the whole time. How are robotic knees different? This is probably the most common question I get. And I tell the patients every time that as long as the knee is done properly, and again, you have a well-aligned, well-balanced knee, you won't be able to tell the difference in the function of the knee, whether it was done with a robot or done with traditional methods. And the goal is to put the components in the proper position so that the patient's happy with the knee. And that's the same goal no matter what, okay? Certainly, uh, you, I guess I, I wanted to show these pictures of the, of the pin sites. These are the pin arrays that have to go into the femur and the tibia when you're doing knee replacements with robotics. Um, they go into the pelvis and the femur uh, when you're doing hip replacements. And that's so that you can actually attach the arrays and the computer in the system can track you during surgery. So that's, that's the one unique step to robotics that you don't have with the traditional system. Uh, but outside of that, in the end result, again, is to be the same. And then how do I decide if I'm going to use a robot during surgery? 
uh, each individual patient's different. And, you know, at Rothman, you know, we're well trained with all, all of our surgeons here are very well trained to handle each patient uniquely. Um, there are some patients like this uh, with the x-rays that I have there, but their, their femur was previously fractured. Um, traditional methods are going to be a little bit more challenging there because of that, the deformity that's in the femur after it healed. Uh, so this may be a patient who would benefit a lot from a robot because I do think that with a robotic case, this patient would likely, at least in my hands, have a better outcome than if uh, a, a more consistently better outcome uh, using a robotic uh, device than someone like myself just doing a freehand technique. Um, having said that, I am a pretty cautious adopter in terms of using robots. I would like to see a little bit more data, and maybe we'll get there soon, uh, showing that patients actually do better with them um, than you know it, compared to traditional methods, but we don't have that yet. And that's where you, you really have to decide, why am I using this tool? Um, is it because I think I can make a patient better than I would be able to otherwise, or is it just a different way of doing the surgery? Uh, and, and that's where I have an individual conversation with each patient uh, in the office determining you know, what I think should happen. And I will let patients know if I think robotics would be best for them um, during their office visit as well. I want to be very upfront with that uh, so that everyone can have, a, have an understanding of kind of what the plan is going forward. I haven't really touched on it too much, um, you know, but I do want to touch on the minimally, minimally invasive part of things as well. Uh, the whole goal of minimally invasive surgery is that you operate through as little tissue as possible. Okay, that means smaller incisions, minimal dissection, and the bottom line is what patients don't like a smaller incision. And it sounds great from a, a premise, and out for a lot of these um, procedures for minimally invasive, you have to use some specialized tools because you simply can't see the bones as you normally would, okay? Uh, the downside that we found with minimally invasive techniques, because these were very popular about 15 years ago, is that it increased the risk of the components not being placed in the right area uh, or being uh, malaligned or increased risk of soft tissue damage because you're trying to stretch things to make the hole big enough for you to get the components in. So just like with the robotics, we did not see any improvement long-term uh, for patients who had minimally invasive techniques. It all came down to, did you do the surgery well? And if you did, the wound healed and there weren't, and there weren't any issues. Um, so a lot of folks uh, in, the, in the arthroplasty world got away from minimally invasive. Now, I will 100% say that it's certainly still used um, by many practices as a, as, as a marketing uh, goal. But I, as I tell my patients, I make the incision as long as it needs to be and no longer. Uh, my goal is to give you a knee that works well, and it doesn't cause you any issues. Uh, the incision will heal, uh, and that's uh, ultimately what I'd like to, uh, like to have happen. So, and the goal is faster recovery. That was the whole idea behind minimally invasive um, surgery about 15 years ago, and we found ways to help patients recover a little bit faster without uh, jeopardizing our operative techniques to make that happen. And a lot of that is with the multimodal pain um, control that we have now, some new anesthetic techniques, and then getting patients up on their feet faster. So instead of trying to fasten the recovery by doing a smaller incision, we now do it by using a, a, a large team of uh, individuals, both before, during, and after surgery um, to help that take place. In terms of what is recovery like, whether you have a robotic knee replacement or a minimally invasive knee surgery uh, or something else, the bottom line is a knee replacement is going to hurt after surgery. Robotics do not necessarily mean that you're going to have less pain, okay? I tell all my patients, you may not love me for the first month. Um, sleep can be challenging. You, be, you get tired as well because you weren't sleeping because of some of the pain. Um, and it's a, it's a bad cycle for the first couple of weeks, or at least it can be, right? Some patients don't have that much pain, but some patients do. And I try to make sure all my patients are aware of that beforehand. Full recovery for a knee surgery, uh, a knee replacement, uh, can take up to a year after surgery. So... It's not one of those procedures that you just wake up from one day and you're like, all right, I'm all better now. I'm gonna carry on with my life. It does take a little bit of time. Um, and then returning to work is dependent on many factors, uh, namely uh, you know, what type of job you have, uh, but it's typically around four to eight weeks, okay? So that's a general recovery. And again, that recovery is very similar no matter whether it's robotic knee replacement, traditional knee replacement, um, or uh, minimally invasive procedure as well. So to wrap up, um, and before I, I let, they, let, let everyone kind of ask some questions, uh, the goal of any surgery is really to improve the patient outcome, okay? Robotics are a tool that can be used to help achieve this goal, but we still aren't really sure 
uh, how much better that makes us at our jobs, which is to give you a knee or hip that functions well. Surgeon skill and expertise still matters. Um, you need to know what your target is and where that target is in order to hit it. Um, and just because you can use a robot doesn't actually mean that uh, you don't have to think about the surgery. And you know, as I said, the surgeon is always in control. Uh, so you want a surgeon who knows what they're doing and that you trust uh, because a, a robot can't make up for uh, what a surgeon lacks in terms of knowledge or skill. Okay, that, that's really the, 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 main, the main goal here. At Rothman, we have experts in, in every type of uh, hip, hip and knee replacement surgery. Um, and, and again, you know, some of us use robots more than others, uh, but by no means does it mean that one is better than the other. Uh, they all have good outcomes, and, and that's ultimately what we're trying to provide to our patients. So that, uh, that's my main talk, okay? I want, I want to give ample time, so I, I think I may have been faster by about, yeah, about uh, 10 minutes. So I, I definitely want to give ample time for everyone to ask questions. I know it is also uh, dinner time, so I, I want to be respectful of everyone's time as well. Natalie, do we have any questions? Can you hear me, Dr. Kruger? I sure can. Okay, I wasn't sure if mine was working. Yes, um, we do. So in the Q&A section, uh, the first question is, if you could pull it up, but I'll, I'll also read it from Linda. Yeah, the, uh, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here so I can see these uh, okay. questions. Awesome. All right. All right, so let's see. The first one from Linda says, any difference in recovery time? Oh, uh, yeah, sorry, I don't see those questions. So I'll have you read them. So okay. any difference in recovery time? Uh, short answer, we do have some, some studies suggesting that robotics may recover in terms of better pain control uh, within about a week faster than um, traditional, knee method, traditional knee replacement methods. Uh, but uh, again, nothing, uh, nothing more than that. So uh, there may be a little bit less pain for the first week or two, uh, but that's about all we can say. We don't know if that's because of the component positioning or because surgeons were able to keep their incisions a little bit smaller um, while they were using the robots. So we're, we're trying to figure that out some. Okay, next question. What brand slash brands do you, you personally use? What do you use to close the incision? So uh, I, am I allowed to say brand names on this or am I gonna get in trouble? <laughs> uh, I mean, I think you can say the ones that you that you usually use. Sure, so I, I, I tend to use the Zimmer Persona knee. Um, that's the knee I use the most and, and that's the knee I, I feel at least provides me with the, the best outcome in most patients. Um, I will also use the Striker Triathlon some um, and, and those are the two that I, I mainly use. Uh, for uni compartmental knee replacements, um, I will use uh, either the, the striker component or the Smith and Nephew uh, uni compartmental uh, knee replacement. So the partial knee replacement, that's what I use. And then in terms of uh, what do I use to close the incision, I use dissolvable sutures. I, I don't use staples. Um, and then I, I typically use a skin glue over the top of that uh, just to help seal the wound. So um, I don't want any of my patients to ever have to come in for, uh, for staple removal or suture removal. Uh, everything is dissolvable. Okay. Next question is, why subject a patient to additional pinholes and radiation if the outcome is the same? Well, it, it's, a, it's a great question, Terry. So the, the thing, that's one of the things that we're trying to figure out. So certainly there are benefits for some patients where the robotic knee just makes more sense. Like I said, if there's something unique about that patient's anatomy, um, at least in my hands, and again, I can't speak for all the surgeons on the call, but there are some patients with certain situations or uh, certain characteristics of their knee or, or their hip for that matter that I think, you know what, I, I think you actually would benefit from uh, the additional pinholes or radiation because I think you're going to have a better outcome of a better knee with robotics than me trying to measure things by myself. Um, not all the surgeons feel that way, but certainly that's how I feel. And, and that's where that really individualized care comes into play uh, because ultimately that's all I'm trying to do. It, it's not that it's not a, a pride thing for me. Uh, either way, in terms of using a robot or not using a robot, I just want to give a patient the best outcome. Uh, so I would say the vast majority of my patients are not subjected to additional pinholes or radiation based on their outcomes. Uh, there are some patients who I think would benefit from them, and in those patients, that's where I really have the conversation. Okay, next question from Walter. He said, am I understanding this correctly? It seems you're saying a lot, preoperative, a lot of preoperative preparation is done when using robotics. 
If this is true, why doesn't conventional surgery use more preparation before surgery? Sure. Uh, I, I guess I should have been more clear. It's not that no preoperative pre preparation is being done uh, traditionally. So we certainly have templates and everything that we use to determine, the, have a good idea of the sizes that are being used before surgery, whether it's a traditional uh, knee replacement or a uh, robotic knee replacement. Um, but certainly from, just like uh, I think Terry mentioned the, on the last question, the CT scans, we typically don't get those on all the patients beforehand. We could, um, and then you could model things off that, but then it becomes a bit more of a, a risk of benefit, right? So uh, certainly we don't want to expose all of our patients to a bunch of radiation if we don't think that's going to benefit us. Uh, so we have to do that for one robotic system. We don't have to do that for traditional means. And if you aren't using the robotic system, there really doesn't seem to be much benefit in doing that before surgery if you're going to use traditional uh, knee replacement. So again, at some point, it comes down to just getting more data to have more data. What we're trying to figure out is how do we use this data to actually help us improve outcomes? Um, so you certainly have more information with, with, with robotic knees, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the outcomes are any better. All right, next question is from Kurt. How long do the implants last? Can you replace slash upgrade them? Will they hold up to physical exercise, Soc soccer, golf, running? Yeah, so the, the best data we have shows that uh, in all knee replacements, about 80% of them last 20 years, okay? We certainly think the implants we're putting in now are going, going to have a better track record um, based on some of the upgrades to the techniques and also the implants themselves, but we don't have that long-term data yet. There are two different types of knee replacements. Some are cementless, in which the bone grows into the implant. Some are cemented, in which the cement basically acts as a grout to hold the implant in place. Um, we're waiting for longer term data to come back to say which one of those may last longer. Uh, but again, a, a good, a well done knee should last a long time. In terms of physical exercise, uh, knees are a little bit different than hips. I'll let my hip patients be a bit more physically active um, because it's a it's a joint that I think is a bit more conducive to it. Having said that, do I have knee, knee replacement patients that run? Absolutely. Um, but at some point that implant will wear out. And I, yes, it's likely that being more physically active, it may wear out earlier, but we don't have great data to suggest that's the case. And the last thing I'll say to that is the whole point of doing a hip or knee replacement is to let patients go back to living the life they wanna live, okay? So if you have someone who's very active, I want to do whatever replacement I, I, I need to so that they can go back and be active. I don't want to do a knee replacement and then tell a patient they can't do X, Y, or Z, even if that's what they love. Um, because I, then again, I'm, I'm not providing them the care that I'd like to. So for active patients, yeah, it, it, it may be a risk to at least some degree in terms of how long it will hold up. But that's why we're doing the, that's why we're doing the joint replacement to begin with. Right, there's some questions coming in the chat as well. So I'll, go, I'll jump over there for a few. Uh, what are BMI ranges for knee replacement surgery? So at the Rothman Institute, we have a institution-wide policy. We will not operate on someone for a primary knee uh, outside of very special circumstances if their BMI is above 40. Um, the reason for that is the risks of complications increase dramatically once you get above uh, BMI of 40. So that's kind of where we're at. On the lower end, uh, it's about 20. Uh, certainly some patients are a little bit less than that, and that's okay. Um, but you don't want to be on either extreme of the BMI. So a BMI between 20 and 40 is, is kind of the sweet spot, so to say. Okay. What if I am knock need? Will it be the same afterwards from Christine? Sure. So uh, the deformity correction is something that most surgeons do in terms of taking a knee that is curved in either direction, whether it's knock need or bow legged, um, and make that straighter. Now, it won't necessarily be perfectly straight. Some surgeons, you know, don't want it to be perfectly straight. Some surgeons think it will be perfectly straight. And again, that's an individual uh, answer in terms of what the patients are looking for in terms of in what the surgeons think would be best for the patient. Most of my patients, I uh, certainly if they're knock need, I, I tell them my goal is to get you straight after. Um, but uh, again, there, there may be some, some situations in which you may not want to correct it all the way. You may want to leave it a, a degree or two a curved in either direction. Okay. What do you think about the prospects of using T solution one? Uh, yeah, I, I'm not that familiar with that um, platform, so I, I can't. Uh, I, I don't want to misspeak on it. Okay. Is it possible to have both both knees done simultaneously? Absolutely. So, in patients who are medically healthy, 
Um, and it, I, typically my age range is around 65 or so, um, you know, 65 or so or younger, uh, and someone who's relatively healthy that I think has the appropriate expectations and support system, then yes, you can do both knees at once. Um, but it's a big recovery. So I, I need to make, I want to make sure the patients are aware of that. It's going to hurt even a little bit more. Um, at the same time, if you have severe arthritis in both knees or hips for that matter, and you can't really put weight on, on your legs or it hurts, you know, excruciatingly uh, bad, then, you know, both knees may not be that much of a jump for you. Okay. Um, what is the, what is negative about the use of cement? Somebody asked. Uh, it's just that it, 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 the, there's nothing necessarily negative about it. It is certainly the gold standard in terms of uh, knee replacements. Uh, and it's by far the most common um, compound that is used to fix the implants onto the bone. The only downside to it is, is it will eventually wear out over time in terms of its support structure. Uh, whether that's 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, it will eventually wear out. So that's the only quote unquote downside of it. Um, but certainly the, the vast majority of knees that I do are cemented, um, and if you look at all of the joints done nationwide, um, there's a there's a, again the vast majority are done cemented and not cementless. Okay. Do most insurance plans cover robotic surgery? Yes. Yep. That that's not an issue, um, and there's no more uh, there's no excess uh, out of pocket costs or anything like that. If there ever was a situation like that, we you know we we talk to you beforehand. Okay. And is there a difference between a male and a female knee? Is there a uh, sure? So um, certainly, there, there may be some different sizes, uh, but during the knee surgery itself, we're you know making sure that we have the appropriately sized implants uh, for your knee, whether that is uh, you know big or small. Certainly, uh, gender gender matters in terms of you know males do tend to have larger knees, but we have all the sizes available during surgery. Um, and again, we planned this beforehand as well to make sure we, you know, if, we, if it was a, a special size that we thought we needed, we had that available, whether that was male or female. Okay. Can physical therapy before the operation improve outcome of knee replacement? Uh, in some situations, yes. It's certainly, it's not going to make you worse. It may cause a little bit more pain, but it's certainly not going to make you worse. The, the stronger you are beforehand and the more motion you have beforehand, um, the stronger you're going to be after surgery and the more motion you'll have before, uh, after surgery as well. Okay. Can a knee replacement be done on someone who wears an Arizona, oops, sorry, Arizona brace to combat ankle pain? Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Can you have hip and knee done on the same side of the body, different times, of course? Yep. Absolutely. Yep. We, we, there's a lot of patients who uh, end up having that, so that, that's that's not a problem at all. Okay. Um, someone asked, how do you decide when you will use robotics? Yeah, uh, and, and I tried to hit this on the talk as well. It's it's very much an individualized process. So um, I don't think I'm that different uh, from many of the surgeons here in terms of yeah, I try to figure out really, really what the best plan is for each patient. There's some patients who have specific anatomy um, or you know physical exam features or you know something different about them that I think would really benefit from robotics. Uh, other patients don't have that, and I don't think the ro I don't think the benefits of the robot would outweigh the risks. So in that case, I don't do that. So uh, it, there are, you know, I'm pretty selective in terms I use on who I use robotics for. Uh, but certainly, when I think the the risk the benefits outweigh the risks, that's a, that's a no brainer. And then I'll be honest, some patients really want robotics, and we'll talk about it a lot, and, and that's fine. I don't, I don't have an issue with that as well. As long as I don't think I'm doing them a disservice, then we can have that conversation. Okay. Um, how big is the hip replacement incision and how do you approach the hip? Uh, the hip, the hip incision is as big as it needs to be. Um, it's typically mine are somewhere between, uh, seven and eight centimeters. Uh, but again, if you're a larger individual or I think I need to make another centimeter or two longer, I don't have any individual, I don't have any issues making that longer. I do a direct anterior approach for my hips. Um, that's simply what I'm, what I'm most comfortable with and, and what I like to use. Okay. Rose asks, if you have a tibial plateau fracture in addition to needing a total knee replacement, will this be taken care of with the new implant? Uh, it depends on how big the tibial plateau fracture is, uh, what the characteristics of the fracture are, um, if it was previously fixed, uh, and uh, you know a, a few other things. So certainly sometimes for more chronic tibial plateau fractures, you can just do a, a knee replacement and not have any issues. Other times you may need to add some uh, other hardware as well. 
Okay, a couple of different questions about getting the knees done simultaneously. Someone asks, do you, do you recommend not doing that? Um, do you perform them? And if you do, do you require the patient to go to a rehab facility afterwards? Uh, so yeah, I definitely perform uh, bilateral knee replacements. Uh, it's about 10% of uh, knee replacements I do are bilateral. Um, again, uh, the patient, I have to feel like the patient's going to do better with that as opposed to getting one done and then the next one done, you know, a few months later. Um, so it's, a, so it's certainly a discussion with the patient. I don't, you know, certainly now, especially, I, I don't necessarily want patients to go to rehab. Um, some patients do, and, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I'd, I'd like to, even my bilateral knee patients to be able to go home and uh, not have to go to a rehab facility thereafter. But if they're not, if we don't think that's safe, um, even if that was a plan before surgery, I think they would be, uh, benefit from going to a rehab facility, then I don't have any issues doing that either. Okay. You shared the expected recovery time for knee surgery. Do you have a general expectation for hip surgery? Yeah, so hip surgery is very similar. Uh, it's probably two to four weeks faster, right? So, and, and probably closer to two. It, hip surgery does not hurt as much as knee surgery in terms of replacement. Um, the hip tends to feel a little bit more normal, uh, faster. Uh, you're up walking with a little bit less pain, um, typically than, than knee surgery as well. But again, the soft tissues have to heal. It doesn't matter, um, you know, no matter how well you do the surgery, you still have to cut through some skin and, and move some soft tissues around. And you want those to heal. You, you don't want the patient to do too much too soon uh, and then just be in pain thereafter. Okay. Um, does knee replacement automatically fix meniscus issues? Uh, yep. During a knee replacement, the meniscus is, is uh, removed. If it's still present, sometimes uh, meniscus is already torn and worn out to the point that it's no longer there. Um, but certainly you wouldn't have to worry about a meniscus tear after a knee replacement. Okay. Does it make sense to have gel injections periodically after knee replacement to help reduce wear and tear slash lifetime of the knee? Uh, I will not inject anything uh, into a, a knee replacement uh, personally um, after a knee replacement's done. Uh, the risk of infection, uh, although it may be small, is, is still present in, in that uh, in, putting anything through the skin and then into the knee joint can increase that risk. So um, an infection is something that joint surgeons like myself worry about the most. We take really great precautions to try to prevent that from occurring. Um, all of us have our little uh, idiosyncrasies in terms of how to prevent that, but I will not inject anything into the hip or, uh, or, or the knee after it's been replaced. Okay. Frank asks, are the pins removed after surgery and what is the implant made of? Sure. Yes, the pins are removed. Uh, you, you don't walk around with pins sticking out of your, your femur or your tibia. Uh, sorry, I should have made that more clear. Um, the implants are typically made out of uh, an, an alloy. Either They're either titanium or cobalt chrome or a mixture thereof. Okay. There are some other metals that can be used as well uh, for, some, for some implant designs, uh, but it, it's somewhere in that family typically. Okay. Is hip surgery an outpatient procedure? It can be. It's up to the patient. Knee, knee surgery can be an outpatient procedure too. Um, it all depends on how well the patient does after surgery. I, I, again, if the patient's doing fine from a pain standpoint, the nurses think their, their uh, pain is controlled, uh, they're able to walk and they clear with physical therapy and they want to go home, then I have no issues letting patients go home. At the same time, if a patient's doing all that and wants to spend a night, I don't have any issues with that either. I just want my patients happy and safe. Um, and as long as they demonstrate that they're able to do both of those things, then I don't, I'm, not, I'm fine with wherever that takes place. Okay. Do you prefer regional or general anesthesia for hip surgery? Uh, hip and knees, I prefer spinal, so regional anesthesia. And the reason being that uh, you, you have less cognitive defects, uh, both during, during the operative stage and thereafter. Um, it's also a little safer from a blood pressure standpoint, um, and they typically have to give you less anesthetic medication uh, during that during that case. Okay. Um, how long is the surgery? I guess we can say for both knee and hip. Yeah, so th they're actually both pretty similar. So the, the typical length is somewhere around an hour. Um, you know, if it takes a little bit longer because of you know whatever needs to take place, and that I, that's fine too. There's certainly no timer. I don't rush anything. Um, you want to, again, the whole goal of the procedure is to make sure that the components are put in properly. Um, and uh, th that's all I care about. But yeah, they both take about an hour. Okay. How soon after surgery can a patient do the stairs? 
So you actually have to do the stairs with physical therapy before you leave the, the hospital or the surgery center. So they make you walk up uh, a, a few stairs just to make sure you're safe doing that. Okay. After a total knee replacement, do you send patients to formal physical therapy or do you give them a home program only? Uh, I do both. Uh, I typically tell the patients just to work with the home physical therapy uh, that I give them for the first two weeks. I, I see most of my patients back at two weeks after surgery. At that point, if they're doing well, they're not having any issues and their pain's controlled, I'll send them to physical therapy so they can work on motion a little bit more. I don't want patients doing too much too soon um, in terms of physical therapy because I do want those soft tissues to heal. I, you know, The surgery hurts enough. I don't want someone just making it hurt to the point that they aren't able to do the exercises. Okay. Do you do metal allergy testing prior to surgery? Not routinely, no. If someone comes to me with a metal allergy, um, then yes, that is, that is something I will, I will consider and talk with the patient depending on what their metal allergies are. Okay. Is it advisable to continue getting cortisone or gel injection shots to avoid knee surgery? It depends if they're working for you. So if you're getting one injection every year and you're happy with what you're able to do, then certainly that, that's, that's not a problem at all. Um, if you, you know, you, the injections were working well initially, and now they're only lasting a couple weeks and you're unhappy with the pain relief that you receive from that and what you're able to do because of your knee arthritis, then I don't, I don't think it would make much sense to continue injections unless you simply didn't want to get knee, knee surgery, or you thought from a medical standpoint, you may not be very healthy for it. Um, in, in those situations and maybe it would make sense. Okay. Another question just came in. Is it recommended to donate your own blood for hip surgery? Yeah, we do not recommend that anymore. Um, so we've got much better in terms of our techniques um, and also the criteria we use to, in terms of blood donation. So no, we, we don't want anyone donating any blood before surgery. Okay. Let's see. Is a multi-collagen supplement helpful? Um, we don't have any data to say it is. I, I tell all of my patients as well, there's a lot of different supplements out there and products available for arthritis. If one of them worked well for everyone, there wouldn't be a thousand different products available. Um, everyone, you know, will try some things and some, some things may work great for other, uh, for you or other individuals. Uh, if that's the case, that's wonderful. Um, but if it doesn't work for you, don't, don't think you're doing something wrong. Um, uh, again, it's, uh, it's almost like cooking. Some people like a little bit more salt and pepper than others. Um, that, that's how some of these non-operative treatments work as well. Okay. And when can you return to work if you work remote at a computer? Uh, some patients now, especially as remote uh, working has increased, are returning uh, within two weeks. Um, I tell, I, I want everyone off narcotics, obviously, uh, before they go back to work. Um, even if you're just working remotely, plenty of damage can be done if you're not, uh, you know, with it cognitively. Um, so I want you to, to not be in pain um, and want you off narcotics. And then if you feel like you can do that and also get up and, and do the exercises that you need to after surgery that I'd like you to do while working remotely, I don't have any issues with that. Okay. Do you put patients on blood thinners pre or post-op? Uh, yes, yeah, so I don't want to say everyone. Uh, most patients uh, almost certainly get a blood thinner uh, after surgery. I don't put anyone on blood thinners preoperatively, however. Okay. And we do do, um, this is brought up before, uh, you know, in terms of some people's religions and, and things like that, they, they don't want to receive anyone's blood. Um, and we, every facility that we operate on has that as well. Okay, yeah, that was a question, um, is if, if you do blood with surgery. Correct. I, I, I'll, I, I can't say that I, I do surgery that is bloodless and people will lose a little bit of blood during surgery. Um, but in terms of, you know, not giving other people blood products, then yes, we do do that. Okay. All right. A few more. Uh, what is the main difference between anterior and posterior hip surgery? Uh, it, it's simply the direction in terms of which the hip capsule is entered. Um, that's where the names come, uh, come from. Certainly some different structures, uh, are incised from both, from both approaches. Uh, just like with knee replacements, if you do a good surgery, then it doesn't really matter what approach you use. Um, but there are some, some differences between the approaches. Uh, and you know, I, I don't want to get too deep in that, but if that's a concern or question you have, then certainly you can ask your surgeon about it. Uh, like I said, I do the direct anterior approach. 
Um, I don't do my primaries through a posterior approach, um, but certainly I, I know plenty of surgeons who do, um, and you know I'm sure they can speak eloquently to why they choose that over some other approaches as well. Okay. Once you have a total knee replacement, if it wears out, can you get another? Absolutely. So it, it all depends on how it wore out. Uh, if it's just the, the plastic kind of part in between the metal, then we can change that out sometimes. Um, otherwise, you know, we can certainly change either the femoral or the tibial component or both. Um, we have got m much better implants for revisions now than we used to. And I think that was one of the reasons that a uh, generation ago, we used to tell everyone just wait, 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 wait as long as you can before getting a, a hip or knee replacement because we were concerned that we wouldn't be able to offer them a very good option once that wore out. I don't think that's the case anymore. And, and again, I also don't think it's right for, for patients to, you know, if you're 50 years old and you have tremendous pain every day because of your hip or knee arthritis, I, I don't think it's fair to patients to say, well, just deal with it for another 20 years or so. And then we'll see if we'll, we'll give you a joint replacement at that time, because I feel like it's wasted a lot of their quality of life years, like I mentioned earlier in the talk. Can you explain quad sparing knee replacement? Sure. So quad sparing simply means whether or not the, uh, the quadriceps tendon is incised or not. Um, I, wish I, I wish I had a diagram up um, to show, but basically you have to get into the knee uh, whether or not you cut through the quadriceps muscle or you cut through the quadriceps tendon, you're going through the knee, okay? Um, you can also try to avoid the, both the tendon and the muscle, and that is certainly in line with the minimally invasive techniques, um, but then you're cutting the capsule where the muscle and the tendon attach to. So it, that's the difference in terms of how you enter the capsule. The bottom line is we don't have any data su that, that suggests one is better than the other or one leads to a faster recovery than the other. Um, so I, I, I would not, not necessarily choose your surgery based on whether or not it's a quote unquote quad sparing, because if you're sparing the quad, then you're just cutting a different part of the capsule. It, it's all, you have to get into the knee, uh, somehow. Okay. And the, um, uh, someone asked about a Baker cyst, the effect of an existing Baker cyst, um, after a total knee replacement. Um, there is no effect. So the Baker cysts tend to form because of the joint inflammation secondary to arthritis. Uh, it creates a lot of pressure on the joint, and it's like a water balloon that starts to expand, and that, that's what the cyst is. Once you have the, the knee replacement done, um, you shouldn't have to worry about that as that our pressure from the arthritis should go away. Okay. If a patient is taking blood thinners, such as Plavix, for cardiac reasons, does that change your approach pre- and post-op? Uh, no, I, but I do work with cardiologists or hematologists in some situations uh, to make sure we have a, a clear plan in place for, you know, what should that, when should the patient stop that blood thinner before surgery? What should they go on during the time, you know, before surgery or during surgery and after surgery so that everyone's on the same page? Okay. Do you use staples or glue to close the incision? Glue. I do not use staples. Okay. If it appears you're going to eventually need the second replacement, how soon after your first recovery is it recommended? And will there be an effect to the replacement or the knee not yet done? Uh, so typically wait at least three months. It's been shown it takes about three months for the body to recover physiologically. Um, so when we feel safe to do the, the, other, part, the other knee or hip in that, in that case. Um, and in terms of a detriment to the other knee, uh, there shouldn't be. And I, I don't think myself or others would offer you another operation if we felt that doing that operation would prohibit you from gaining um, the mobility or strength that you need still in that other leg. Okay. Is the kneecap removed or replaced in total knee replacement? It, it can be. So there's, it's not removed, um, but it can be, uh, again, it's resurfaced. Okay. Um, some surgeons will resurface all of their kneecaps. Some, sur some surgeons resurface none of their kneecaps. Other surgeons resurface some of their kneecaps. That's the camp I'm in. Um, it depends on how much arthritis is present <clears throat> in that kneecap itself and, and also the, the tracking. So again, a few things you look for intraoperatively. Um, but certainly if the kneecap is really worn out, then yeah, I, I would resurface it. I think most people would as well. Okay. There were some personal questions that were asked. Um, 
if, if someone, if anybody wants to email those specific questions um, to marketing at rothmanortho.com, I'm, I'm happy to, you know, get those answered for you. And, um, you know, they're a little more personal, so we can, we can get those answered and, and email you back. Um, there are My hair is natural. Was that one of the questions? <laughs> that was one. I skipped over it. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so it looks like we're we're coming up on about seven. So here I'll type in I'll type in that um, email address for someone just asked. We'll send it to everybody. It's a it's a it's a big topic to go through in an hour or a half hour. Yeah, you know, I, I wanted to leave a lot of time for questions at the end, um, but I, I do hope uh, you know folks felt that they were able to understand a little bit more about what, what robotics and minimally invasive surgery is and is not. Um, but uh, certainly, like I said, myself and, and other surgeons here, uh, you know, we just want what's best for you. So it, it, you can feel free to bring up any of these questions to myself or anyone else that you see at Rothman. Um, we're happy to have those conversations with you to, to figure out what's best for you and in, in your situation. Yes. Well, thank you, Dr. Kruger. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, like I said, I, I just put the email in the chat box. So it's marketing at rothmanortho.com. If you have any specific questions or we did not get to your question tonight, um, feel free to, to message um, and email us there and, and we'll get your uh, question answered. Right. Thank you so much for putting this together, Natalie. I appreciate it. Of course. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. All right. Take care.